Good morning, everybody. All right, a, a happy day after Christmas, y'all. I hope Santa was good to you and everybody got what you wanted for Christmas. But if you didn't get what you wanted for Christmas, maybe you just didn't know what to say in response to that strange and unusual gift you got yesterday. Well, I want to coach you and help you out this morning so you'll be ready for next year, okay? So here are the top 10 things to say when you don't know what to say about that strange and unusual gift that you got for Christmas. Number 10, now that's a gift, okay? Number nine, no, really, you shouldn't have. <laughs> I don't deserve a gift like that. Uh, number eight, this is perfect for so many occasions, like cleaning the basement and washing the dog. Um, number seven, man, I hope that doesn't catch fire. It's fire season, you know. Uh, number six, when I gain another 100 pounds, this should fit perfectly. Number five, if the dog runs off with this, I'll be furious, right? Number four, I never in my wildest dreams believed that anybody would give me anything like this. Uh, number three, to think I got this the year that I vowed to give all my gifts to charity. Number two, sadly, I enter the Federal Witness Protection Program tomorrow, so I can't keep it. And the number one response to give to a person who gave you that strange and unusual gift that you, you were like, oh my goodness, is this. I love it, but I fear the jealousy it will inspire. There you go. Maybe, <laughs> maybe that'll help you. Maybe that'll help you next year. Uh, just kidding. Y'all know better than that. Speak the truth in love, right? Speak the truth in love. And if you can't say anything nice, my mom always said, don't say anything at all except thank you, right? Now, on a more serious note, let's look together at the Word of God this morning. That's why we're together, amen, to worship and to hear a word from the Lord. So let's look at Luke chapter 1, and we're going to begin in verse 26. And uh, let's please stand for the reading of God's Word. In the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth to a virgin engaged to a man named Joseph of the house of David. The virgin's name was Mary, and the angel came to her and said, Greetings, favored woman. The Lord is with you. But she was deeply troubled by this statement, wondering what kind of greeting this could be. And then the angel told her, don't be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. Now listen, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High, and the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. And Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I've not... I'm a virgin. <laughs> and the angel replied to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. And consider your relative Elizabeth. Even she's conceived a son in her old age, and this is the sixth month for her who was called childless. For nothing will be impossible with God. And I love her response. See, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you have said. Then the angel left her. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you today. On this day after we celebrate the birth of Christ, we thank you for your word today that gives us great encouragement as to how we can continue Christmas all year round. And we thank you in Jesus' name, amen. 
may be seated. You know, we're all familiar with uh, the Reverend Clement Moore. I don't know if you knew he was a, he was a uh, minister, uh, translated a lot of Hebrew, uh, Old Testament, and uh, he uh, was a kind of a, a professor, and he was a, was a preacher as well. Clement Moore, y'all remember that poem that he wrote? Twas the night before Christmas, right? Well, with apologies to Clement Moore, I wrote a poem just for today called Twas the Day After Christmas, okay? So here it goes, all right? Don't laugh at me, okay? I, I know the pants on Christmas Eve caused quite a stir. And, and to solve the debate, those were not jams, okay? Those were not my pajamas. Those were real pants, okay? So take it easy on me today, all right? So here's the poem. "'Twas the day after Christmas and all through the house. The children were exhausted, especially me and my spouse. That Christmas bonus I got, my spouse had now spent, and when I looked in my pocket, I couldn't find a red cent. I felt dizzy for a moment, so I lay down in bed, for I had visions of overdrafts dancing in my head. The tree was now sagging, the lights were all tangled, some ornaments were broken, and the star was all mangled. Those brightly wrapped presents that promised surprise looked like trash mixed with laundry and few the right size. With all the wrappings, ribbons, and boxes, I confess, when I looked all around, our house was a mess. So why call it Christmas when there's little celebration of the Christ whom we've lost in our modern translation? Twas the day after Christmas. Well, I want to ask you this morning, what about the day after Christmas? What happens in your life as soon as the gift grab is done and all the high-carb high meals are over <laughs> and the family gatherings are done and it's, you go back to normal again with life? You know, there's just something about the Christmas season I think we need to think about have you ever noticed that most of us, you know, for a while we're pretty good, aren't we? I mean, we for a little while we're good. Um, we do nice things for other people. We make some positive changes for a few weeks. Uh, we become very generous and trying to help the needy. Some people even swallow their pride and go out of the way to make things right with other people and reconcile and, and seek forgiveness and, you know, and, and, and try to make up. We, you know, we give gifts, we write cards, we're, we're good for a little while. I don't know, maybe there's something about that naughty and nice list thing that's, that, that motivates people, I don't know. But then everything goes back to normal. Um, and there's something ultimately disappointing, I think, about what we would call the world's view of the spirit of Christmas because it seems that the spirit of Christmas is a passing thing and the old habits and the old attitudes just seem to creep right back in and we lose the very things that the heart seems to long for you know that that feeling of peace and forgiveness and compassion and the satisfaction of helping other people in this season and all too often that seems to evaporate and vanish away as if it never happened the day after christmas it, it, and something like that actually happened in history. You know, I'm a history guy, and um, I love the story of the Christmas truce that happened back in World War I. Y'all know that story, right? 1914, you know, the generals didn't command it, that's for sure. And there were some people who were against it, namely Adolf Hitler, who was in the German army at the time and wasn't der Fuhrer of the Second World War. But there were people against it, but the generals didn't command it, but the troops, they just did it spontaneously. And it's an amazing story when you go back and you look at it and there were all these, you know, estimated 100,000 British and French and German troops uh, near Ypres, I think is that how they pronounce that, in Belgium. And they were along the front and they just spontaneously stopped fighting. I mean, those big guns, the artillery, stopped booming for a night and a half. I mean, it, it, was, it was quite amazing. And uh, I've got some eyewitness testimony. I don't know if any of that's showing up on the screen or not, but there's the Christmas truce, a picture of it. And then 
Here's one of the testimonies right there. First, the Germans would sing one of their carols, and, and then we'd sing one of ours until we started up, O Come All Ye Faithful. And the Germans immediately joined in singing the same hymn in the Latin words, Adeste Fidelis. Y'all have tried to figure that out on, uh, you know, Bing Crosby or Nat King Cole's album. That's what it is, okay? <laughs> and I thought, well, this really is the most extraordinary thing. Two nations both singing the same carol in the middle of a war. And that's what happened. I mean, it, was, it was amazing, uh, some of the stuff that was going on. And, and there's a little account of it. Uh, that They got out of their trenches, and, and they called out Merry Christmas to each other. And, and uh, you know, they uh, shook hands, exchanged gifts. I, I read about one, one uh, couple of guys that cut the buttons off their uniforms and exchanged them with one another, and just little trinkets and scarves and different things that they exchanged. And they also had a soccer match. Um, they call it football. We wouldn't call it football. It was soccer, okay? They didn't have points on the ends of their ball. It was a round ball. And the Germans won three to two. Um, so they had, and, and they even helped each other try to find, you know, get these bodies and get them properly off the battlefield and get them buried. Um, and, and it was an extraordinary event. In fact, there was a, uh, during the time, they, they, had a, they had a church service, impromptu. They, they had one of the Angli Anglican priests out there who preached on Psalm 23. And a German divinity student even translated uh, for the German troops what the English preacher was saying about the scriptures. It was amazing what happened, that impromptu truce in 1914. But then, reality, right? That's what one of the guys said, Alfred Anderson, on the British side. We shouted Merry Christmas even though nobody felt merry and the silence ended early in the afternoon and the killing started again. It was a short piece in a terrible war. So everything went back to normal. And they started killing each other again as if Christmas Day had never happened. Don't miss that. The day after Christmas, everything went back to normal. Same old, same old. Now, how can we change that? How can we make Christmas last? How can the changes that, that you make for a few weeks and I make for a few weeks during the year to make the good list, the nice list, how can we keep that going through the new year? That's the question, right? Or are we, are we just going to have to say, well, you know, same thing they did during World War I, you know, everything went back to, to normal. Now, I don't know about you, but I'd like to think that this next year, that I'm going to rise above the ordinary in my walk with the Lord. I want to take it to the next level. I really do. So I want us to think about the difference between the world's generated spirit of Christmas and the spirit of Christ as we enter the new year. So in the back of your bulletin, you got the outline, and here's the first point in it right there. The spirit of Christmas can be superficial, but the spirit of Christ is supernatural. Did you see that scripture there in verses 30 to 33? We'll go back to it again and look at it. The angel told her, don't be afraid. You found favor with God. Now listen, you're going to conceive and give birth to a son, and you're going to name him Jesus. He's going to be great. He'll be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he'll reign over the house of Jacob forever, and his kingdom will have no end. Lee Allen had a sing about that. You will name him Jesus, meaning Yahweh saves, Yahweh delivers. That speaks of his crucifixion. That speaks of our salvation. And the point is here, and he says he'll reign, right? He'll reign. That speaks of his coronation. And the point is that Christmas means a whole lot more than the superficial clutter that we piled onto it. It's kind of like what the Grinch found out. It's one of my favorite Christmas stories. That's why they... They pinned on our tree the Grinch ornament and put my name on it. Not because I'm a Grinch, 
but because I love the story. Because the story is a story of redemption. It's a story of conversion, if you will. And you remember, he stole all their Christmas stuff, and he thought, that'll stop the celebration. But in the immortal words of Dr. Seuss, who's now been banned, I know, you know, we can't even have Dr. Seuss books anymore, right? Is that, is that still true? Is he back, or is he still on the canceled list? Still on the canceled list, okay. But in his famous words, he said, he hadn't stopped Christmas from coming. It came. Somehow or other, it came just the same. It came without ribbons. It came without tags. It came without packages, boxes, or bags. He stood there shivering in the snow, and it says he puzzled till his puzzler was sore. Remember that? And then the Grinch thought of something he hadn't before. Maybe Christmas, he thought, doesn't come from a store. Maybe Christmas, perhaps, means a little bit more not maybe it absolutely does amen christmas is more than all the clutter more than all the outward symbols it's more than some superficial sentimental attitude some warm fuzzy that we experience and it's a one-off it's more than that i mean i love that just like everybody else here does it's great but you know what? I call that the spirit of Christmas. It's the world's notion of it. It's something, something that's passing. You can't live on that. It's trying to live on Christmas cookies. And, and unless your buddy the elf, with his four main food groups, right? Candy, candy canes, candy corn. Okay, I'm getting some nods. And what's the last one? Come on. Y'all are too holy today. <laughs> Syrup. He put it on his spaghetti. Yikes. It's sweet, but it's superficial. That's the world's idea of it. The spirit of Christ Christmas doesn't last. And the spirit of Christmas, it can be superficial, but the spirit of Christ is supernatural. It's a supernatural event. When God came down in, at Christmas time, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us to walk among us, to breathe our air, to feel our pain, to die for our sins, to be raised from that tomb and ascend back to the right hand of the Father. That's supernatural. That lasts. It's not like this superficial thing that's sweet and then it goes away and in the end it's unsatisfying. Jesus is the real deal. God came in Christ to give us the greatest revelation of himself that, that we'll ever know until we're in his presence. Emmanuel, God with us. And now he's not only God with us, but through the person of the Holy Spirit, he's God in us. And believe me, that's not superficial. That's supernatural. And that continues beyond the actual celebration of a day. So that leads me to the second thought. Not only is it true that the spirit of Christmas can be superficial and the spirit of Christ is supernatural, but then secondly, the spirit of Christmas is annual, but the spirit of Christ is eternal. Spirit of Christmas, annual, once a year, and then it fades. And according to the psychologists, there's a lot of depression that happens after. Christmas. Some people even take their lives. In fact, statistics show more people take their lives between Christmas Day and New Year's than any other time in the year by far. The Christmas blues is not just another of Dean Martin's favorite holiday hits. It's a thing. It's a real thing. And it's simply, I think, because a lot of people build up unrealistic expectations for Christmas like old Clark Griswold in the Christmas Vacation movie. That dude was literally possessed by the world spirit of Christmas and he literally drove himself and his family and his neighbors, love the neighbors, crazy in his pursuit of it, didn't he? Y'all are too holy. I, I know some of y'all have seen that movie. 
Hopefully you saw the cleaned up version on TBS or something like that, not the real racy version anyway. But seriously, all that amped up anticipation, hyped up expectation has a lot more to do with the world spirit of Christmas and has very little to do with the spirit of Christ. It's an annual emotional event. Now what can change that? Leave the tree up year round? I know some people will actually do that. They decorate it with different stuff every month. Don't raise your hand right now. We'll, we'll have an invitation in a minute. But <laughs> Some people leave the tree here around. That's not the answer. Put the Santa suit on and don't take it off. No. Um, sing with Elvis. Why can't every day like, be like Christmas? No. <laughs> Seriously, how can we take what we experience with God during Christmas and use that to make a real difference in our lives going into the new year and beyond. Well, look again at verse 34. Look at what he says here, what the, the Bible says. It says, Mary asked the angel, how can this be since I'm a virgin? And the angel replied to her, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Did you see that? The Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's the answer. We need to hand the reins over and let the Holy Spirit take control of our lives so that whatever we do or say, it'll reflect the Spirit of Christ. Remember that, that key verse? I mean, we're in the book of Acts. We'll go back there again in the new year. But Acts 1.8, that's the key verse. When the Holy Spirit comes upon you, what? You will be witnesses to me you will be my witnesses right yeah it is a command but it's also a statement of unavoidable fact we will be his witnesses i never will forget when we finished uh, up my studies we were trying to finish up my phd and, and i was studying with a professor at the university of lund in sweden we stayed over in denmark and i'd ride the hydrofoil over there but when we finished up six months of doing that, and I finished up my, uh, my PhD dissertation, getting ready to turn it in, we had the incredible blessing of being able to travel through Europe for two weeks. And of course, I wanted to see Switzerland because I'm a mountains guy. She's a beach girl, I'm a mountains guy, and I won. <laughs> so, <laughs> so we went to Switzerland, and we went to the Alps in France, and we went to the Italian Alps, and I, you know, Austrian Alps. I mean, it was all Alps all the time. God bless her. She's a patient woman. And, um, and, it, and, you know, we didn't have any money. We didn't have a tour guide. We didn't have, you know, a lot of money to do this. So it was a DIY deal. So self-guided tour. And we could not help but be witnesses to the fact that we weren't from around there. Right? They knew we were from America. They knew we were Americans. And they knew we were from the South. They dialed in on that too. In fact, I, I, I remember, because I could speak German, because I had to learn theological German with, with seminary uh, and, and my PhD work. Um, we were going from Southern Germany and Bavaria into Austria, and we were coming up to the border crossing, and Pat got her, you know, she was getting her passport ready and everything, and I said, oh, don't worry about it, I got it. And, uh, and so we came up to the guard, and I, and I said, Grüß Gott. And he said, ah, go ahead. And we went on. And then we came back, and we came into another border crossing, and she was driving. And she tried it, Grüß Gott. And he said, Papieren bitte. Papers, please. <laughs> He knew that she wasn't from around there and uh, made her yield her papers. But anyway, yeah, we, we bore witness to the fact that we weren't from there, right? But now we didn't have a coordinated conversation in the rental car and say, let's bear witness to the fact that we're from America. No, they knew it. <laughs> it was pretty obvious. All we had to do was open our mouths and speak. And it was pretty clear. The only choice we had as witnesses to the fact that we were travelers from America 
is what kind of vacationers were we going to be? Were we going to be, you know, nice and kind? Or were, go were you going to be witness, you know, witnesses that were impatient and rude? That was it. And, and the same thing's true of us as believers. We are witnesses. When we open our mouths, we're witnesses. I mean, we're, we're ambassadors of Christ wherever we go, whatever we do. And people are looking at us. They know. Most people know. You know? So think about that. You know, 1 Peter 2.11 says we're pilgrims and strangers passing through this world. Paul said in, in Philippians 3.20 that our citizenship's in heaven. I mean, we're travelers, right? Just like somebody traveling through a foreign country. If you're a believer, you're a witness to Jesus Christ in this lost world. And the only question is whether we're going to be a good one or a bad one. Several years ago, I was in, in the Nashville area uh, for the Tennessee Baptist Convention. And I was staying in a hotel and a bunch of other preachers were staying there with me. And uh, we were checking out, <clears throat> and there were two ladies up at the front desk, and they were trying to split uh, the room costs with a couple of preachers who roomed together, and they were trying to split it out and put, you know, half on one credit card and half on the other. And um, managers trying to be courteous, trying to be efficient, trying to work it out for the guys, but that wasn't enough for the preacher in line behind me. He blurted out, oh, come on, what's the hold up? I got to go. And the lady very graciously said, sir, we're doing the best we can here. Just be patient with us. And he grumbled something under his breath. And I paid for my room and walked up to him privately and looked him in the eye. And I said, brother, remember, you're a witness. These people may not know Jesus. Seriously. <laughs> You'd have thought I'd have shot him. <laughs> He needed to be shot after what he did, but anyway. But we need to remember that, especially as, as we go to the as we go to the restaurant after we leave here. And, and we need to remember that as we stand in the return line with all the rest of the world trying to get rid of that gift you got that I was trying to help you with earlier. How can I be a good witness? The key is whether. You're willing to submit your thoughts and your words and your deeds to the controlling influence of the Spirit of God. See, if you'll run your decisions by Him before you speak and act, if you'll let Him call the shots in your life, the Bible says the, the Spirit will produce in your life some wonderful fruit. Right? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. So, if you're one of the many who has a tough time after Christmas, you may need to ask yourself a hard question. Was I just in the Christmas spirit? Or is the spirit of Christ empowering me to live a life that pleases God and draws people to Jesus? That's the question. Notice the angel not only told Mary the Holy Spirit's going to come upon you, but back to the point, really. I was really just chasing the rabbit just then. Sorry. But the angel spoke of Jesus and said, his kingdom will never end. The spirit of Christmas is temporary. It's an annual event, but the kingdom of God is here to stay. <laughs> Amen. It's eternal. And when he comes back, he's going to be king of kings and lord of lords on this earth for a thousand years. And then the kingdoms of, our, of, of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and of his Christ and we'll reign with him for all eternity. So, think about that. One day shouldn't be different than any other day when it comes to the spirit of Christ. And if we're all caught up in the, in the spirit of Christmas, we may enjoy a few days, even hours of nostalgia and euphoria. But if you want the celebration to continue, you got to see the big picture of Christmas this event changed all of eternity from a human perspective and it's a continual celebration of Christ who lives in us, who's preparing a place for us and who's coming back for us someday. That's what it's about. That leads me to the last difference between the spirit of Christmas and the spirit of Christ for your outline and that is the spirit of Christmas can be a human product but the spirit of Christ is all about a divine person. A divine person. Several years ago, I was on a flight 
and I engaged conversation with a fellow next to me. And we'd been talking for a little while before we finally got around to the question. All us guys ask each other the question, which is, what do you do for a living, right? I mean, we all get around to that because that's how we identify ourselves by what we do. So we finally get, we're getting around to that question. I knew it was coming. It's just part of the game. It's, it's a, it, but in a way, I kind of hate to tell people what I do, not because I'm ashamed of it, not at all. The reason I, I do is because people get all weird on me when I do, you know? I mean, everything changes. Chase another rabbit. I was at a, a, a car lot trying to buy a car one time, and the, and the salesman cussed, and then he asked me the question, what do you do for a living? I told him I was a preacher. He said, well, praise the Lord, brother. I'm not kidding. This really happened. One minute I'm a normal guy, the next I'm a candidate for a reality TV show. But back to the story. So this guy on the plane, he's sitting next to me, and he asked me what I do, did. And I thought, here we go again. But I said, well, I'm a I'm pastor of a church in Tennessee. And he said, you know, I really never got into that religion thing that much. I mean, I'm glad it works for you, but it really doesn't work for me. Ever heard that one? I've heard that one from family recently. <laughs> glad it works for you, but it really doesn't work for me, that religion thing. And, and you know what I said to him? I said, yeah, religion doesn't work for me either. And he was like, you're a preacher. What? I said, yeah, religion doesn't work for me at all. And following Jesus isn't a religion. It's a relationship with a real person. Religion will send you straight to hell. Huh? I said, I would never try to lead anybody to get into religion, but I want everybody to follow Jesus. So folks, the, the season we just celebrated is not the creation of the merchants to make more money. It's about a divine person. It's about Jesus. So if, if you want things to be different, if you don't want to be like those soldiers who remembered, you know what, the day after Christmas, everything went back to normal. The war started up again. We started killing people again. If you don't want life to be normal, then you need to meet this divine person, develop a relationship with him, follow him, surrender your life to him. That's what Mary did. Look at it. Verse 38. See, I am the Lord's servant, said Mary. May it happen to me as you have said. And then the angel left her. What a great way to live. To hear God speak and simply say, Lord, I'm yours. So whatever you say goes, I just count it a joy to be known as your servant. Be it done unto me according to thy word, to use the King James. You know, years ago, there was a, an older gentleman who attended Salvation Army meetings in the city. And he and his wife had never had the benefit of a formal education. Both had worked hard all their lives. But he came home after one of the meetings, and, and uh, she asked him how the services went that day. And he said, you know what? It was great. But I'd really like to have one of those red Salvation Army jackets, you know, like they wear. And so his wife... For Christmas, bought him a new red jacket. Kind of like Dick had on a couple weeks ago. Awesome. Uh, Jeff's got one on today. Looking sharp back there, bro. He said, I want one of those red Salvation Army jackets. So she bought him one for Christmas. And he was all excited. And, and he wore it to the worship services of the Salvation Army. And she said, well, how were the services today? And he said, the services were good. And everybody liked my new red blazer. He said, you know what? Those Salvation Army guys have a crest on their, on their, on their uh, blazer. I kind of like to have one on mine, too. And uh, I, by the way, anybody know what's on a Salvation Army 
jacket, two words, well, three words, blood and fire. Blood and fire. That describes the blood that was shed by Jesus for our salvation and the fire of the Holy Spirit, right? Who fills every believer. And his wife says, okay, I'll, I'll embroider a crest on your blazer, but she couldn't spell. I mean, again, they didn't have a formal education. She, she couldn't spell blood and fire. So the only thing she figured to do was to copy the words she saw opposite on a sign on a building that she could see out of her window in their little apartment. And so she sewed that onto his red blazer. And the next Sunday, he, the old guy went to Salvation Army worship service and got home and his wife Ask him the question, well, how were the services today? And he says, oh, it was great. And everybody loved my blazer. And not only that, they liked my crest better than theirs. Because on his blazer, it said, under new management. <laughs> <laughs> but think about that. That was Mary. She was under new management lord i'm your servant may it be done unto me according to your word now how can you take the spirit of love and joy and peace and forgiveness and goodwill that lasts for a day or two at christmas and run that on out 365 crown jesus as king of your life Give yourself over to his control. Bring yourself under his new management as we go into this new year. God's people said, amen. amen.